Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am the Omni Viewer, and I'm here to once again give my perspective as an author on a particular subject in regards to storytelling. And this one's kind of a hot button topic. It's... well, it's the subject of putting politics and messages and whatnot into a story. Particularly escapism, but also just in general. Like I said, that's kind of a divisive topic these days. More and more, there have been a lot of instances where messages and politicizing and all sorts of commentary about real-world topics have been inserted, sometimes very forcefully, into various works. From superhero comics, to the recent Star Wars movies, to... You name it, it's probably happened at some point. There have been political messages and social messages just crammed into various works where previously such messages were either very minor details or not even a detail to be considered at all. They were never actually that big of a part of it before, and now suddenly they are. And while there are, of course, plenty of outlets that champion this sort of thing, the overwhelming response from a lot of people just in the audience has basically come down to, what the heck is this doing in my escapist fantasy? I didn't come to this to be preached at. I didn't buy this comic to be told about diversity. I didn't go to this movie to be reminded who the president is. Why is all of this stuff getting in there? I don't want to be reminded of the real world. That's why I'm going to the movies or reading these books or whatever you choose to do. And of course, the response from the people actually making this stuff, and therefore the people who are inserting these messages in the first place, or by their supporters, is that you have no right to complain if you're in the audience and you don't like that, because all fiction, by nature, is inherently political. It's unavoidable. Therefore, you can't really complain about the sudden appearance of politics and social messages in your fiction, because it's always been there. I occasionally see arguments made to try justifying that it's always been there, Particularly one that sticks out in my mind is when people bring up Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Even though it's usually classified as a horror novel, it is also widely considered to be one of the progenitors of what would become the science fiction genre, because it's about a scientist who uses scientific methods to create his monster. Therefore, even though science fiction didn't technically exist when the story was first written, it's kind of the forerunner to science fiction. And of course, it's loaded with themes, loaded with messages, and it was written by the bane of all toxic basement-dwelling fans the world over, a woman. That being Mary Shelley. Yeah, Frankenstein is a popular one to bring up as proof that genres like science fiction were always political in nature. But the people making that argument are leaving out a few details. See, when Mary Shelley first came up with Frankenstein over a hundred years ago, she wasn't really setting out to tell some kind of message. At the time, she had just run off with her boyfriend, gotten together with another young couple that had also run off from wherever they came from, and they were just squatting in a mansion, not contributing anything to society during a period where the weather was, let's just say, unusual for the period. So, inspired by the gloomy and eerie weather, the four layabouts decided to have a scary story contest. See who could come up with the scariest, most intense, most chilling story. And, during this time, Mary Shelley had a vision, no doubt fueled by the alcohol that was being consumed in heavy amounts during the quartet's stay in that mansion, which would eventually become a key scene in the story that would be Frankenstein. So, she cobbled all of this story together, and the rest is history. She wound up winning and wound up publishing her work. But she came up with the story not because she was trying to send some sort of message, but because she was trying to win a game she was competing against her friends at. And how do you win a game where the point is telling a story? 
by making the story about something. You put themes in there. You make your story deep, or at the very least, you make it seem deep. And that's what Shelley did. You don't just say the ghost jumps out and says boo. You say why the ghost is there and why the ghost being there is somehow a commentary on the human condition. That's how you win a scary story contest. And that's what Mary Shelley essentially did, not with a ghost, but with a man-made monster. But also worth noting is that if Mary Shelley hadn't written Frankenstein, someone would have eventually. Not necessarily that specific story, but someone would have come up with something similar and therefore it would have had the exact same effect. You see, Mary Shelley didn't just pull the story of Frankenstein out of thin air, not even strictly from that weird vision she had while she was trying to come up with it. She was inspired by real-world events. Shelley came from a fairly well-to-do family that was very well-versed in all the current events of the time. And one of the things that was very popular to do in that time period was to try reanimating dead bodies. Yeah, that was a thing lots of people were doing. Some of them were doing it for scientific reasons, some of them were doing it for sociological reasons, some of them were doing it just to draw a crowd because they were sideshow carnival barkers. But it was a very common practice at the time. Well, I say common, it's not really like there were just people out in the streets digging up dead bodies and trying to reanimate them on every street corner, but it was a pretty frequent thing. Frequent enough that it would have been known, and Mary Shelley would have known about it. So, with that in mind, somebody writing a story based on that idea was inevitable. If Shelley didn't do it, someone else inevitably would have. Another woman, a man, doesn't matter, it still would have happened at some point. So I realize that might burst a few people's bubbles, but Mary Shelley just wasn't interested in pushing your socio-political messages that wouldn't exist for another century. She was just messing around with her friends. Okay, so that's a little bit off topic, I admit, but in other ways it's very much on topic because the people who are using the argument that Mary Shelley creating a story with themes that would eventually spawn the science fiction genre, therefore justifying all science fiction being political, those people are the ones who generally are trying to justify their own insertion of politics into their fiction. And, like I said, their primary argument is that all fiction, regardless of genre and regardless of the intended audience, is inherently political. So that's the main topic I want to discuss. And I have to say that I completely disagree with the notion. To be clear, there are some subgenres that are specifically political. You have the political thriller, the political satire, the political drama. Some historical films are deeply rooted in politics. But overall, I really can't say that I believe all fiction is political. Here, let me give you some examples from the world of classic animation. Take the Looney Tunes shorts that were made back in the Golden Age. There are some Looney Tunes shorts that do certainly have a socio-political bend, particularly the ones made during World War II, where America was at war with various foreign powers. On one side, you had the Nazis and Mussolini's regime, though we didn't really do much with them because they fizzled out on their own. And on the other side, you had the Japanese Empire. So, during that period, you had some cartoons made that had the characters going up against the people who would basically be classified as the enemy. And, yeah, it's hard to say those cartoons didn't have some kind of message to them. Of course, that message was, Nazis are stupid, throw rocks at them, but still, kind of hard to say that those weren't politically charged. They clearly were. But on the other hand, the vast majority of Looney Tunes shorts were pretty apolitical, I would say. I mean, I personally can't think of any sort of political message that comes from seeing Sylvester trying to catch and eat Tweety Bird, because it's pretty much what it looks like. It's a cat chasing a bird. You don't really have anything deeper than that most of the time. 
The only instance I can think of where Sylvester and Tweety did try for social commentary was their Alcoholics Anonymous parody. Or suppose you have those shorts where Daffy Duck is trying his hardest to upstage Bugs Bunny during a particular performance and it always backfires against him. That's not really political. If anything, it's just the people who made it drawing from their own experiences being in the entertainment world, where actors are constantly fighting for the spotlight because theater and film and cinema, that's a dog-eat-dog -dog competition. You want to be the star because otherwise you might fall into obscurity. And I think even outside the world of entertainment, everyone has had that experience where there's just that one person who comes along and does exactly what we're doing, but while we are working our butts off to try and get that job done and never getting any credit for it, that other guy does it without breaking a sweat and everybody loves him. That's certainly a real world experience, but it's not political. It's just observational. It's told from a particular perspective. And with that, I think I've cracked the code. I don't believe that all fiction is inherently political. I believe that all fiction is told from the storyteller's perspective. And there is a big difference between those two. There can be some overlap. If the storyteller is a very politically minded person, then obviously that perspective will be politically charged. But if the storyteller couldn't care less about politics, then they're obviously not going to make a story that is politically charged. They're just going to tell a story based on their perception of the world. And that sort of thing is inevitable. That sort of thing, there's really nothing inherently wrong with. I mean, if your perspective is a harmful one, maybe. But in general, there is no harm in that. I think you'll find that apolitical storytelling really is the majority of storytelling. Not all of it is necessarily trying to send a message. Even though it's always written from the author's perspective, they're not necessarily trying to force that perspective onto you. They're just saying how they see the world. And most audiences are willing to accept that that's how the author sees the world. It's not necessarily how the audience sees the world, but whatever. They're just there for a good story. With that being said, though, I don't want to make it sound like there's no place for politicizing or message sending in fiction. There is a place. It's not necessarily always warranted, but if you can insert it naturally, yeah, that works. In fact, escapism can be a great vehicle for sending a message. You've already got an audience, so if they're paying attention to what you're doing as far as telling a good story and showing us good characters, if you can also get them to think about something, all the better. You don't necessarily have to, though, but if you can, that's actually a pretty good way to get things across. But lots of people have been trying to put messages into escapism these days, and people have been reacting quite strongly against it. So why is that? What is it about the current trend of inserting messages into popular fiction that's turning people away from it rather than drawing them to it and making them think about it? As far as I can tell, it's because of the delivery. You see, there are three different ways an author can convey a message in a story, summarized by one of three statements. This is what I think. I want to know what you think. And this is what you should think. The first one, this is what I think, is the most common form of message sending and storytelling. It basically means the author has put their perspective, whatever it may be, into the story. That's the statement, and now that they've said their piece, they're just leaving it at that and moving on. The statement is there. It's for you to consider. You can agree with it or not. You can scrutinize it and what it means for the greater world and the author in particular, or not. But either way, the author has said what they think. The second statement, I want to know what you think, is not as common and much trickier to do. Of the three statements, it's actually the trickiest. 
That's where you start to get into stories that are morally ambiguous and play with shades of gray in terms of who is right and who is wrong. In that case, the author is leaving it up to you, the audience, to decide which side is right and which side is wrong. You will still probably get a conclusion, but you will have the perspectives of both sides of a particular argument represented more or less equally, and therefore you will be left to wonder is this really the best conclusion that could have happened? Or was there a different conclusion? Did the right side win? Or did the wrong side win? And that's something you discuss among your friends, or just make videos on YouTube theorizing about them if you have enough free time. Then there's that third perspective. This is what you should think. That's where we basically get into the realm of propaganda. It's like that first perspective but cranked up to 11. The author there is basically saying, this is what I think, what I think is right, unambiguously the correct way to think, you should think the same way, and if you don't think the same way, you are wrong and you are part of the problem. Those are the three different ways you can convey a message in fiction, and perhaps you've already figured out which one of those is permeating popular fiction in this current climate. It's the last one. This is what you should think. See, generally, if the author goes with the this is what I think approach, that's easier for the audience to just set aside. It's like, okay, so this is what that guy thinks. Maybe I think he's crazy, but what the heck? It doesn't bother me. I still think the story is good, whatever. That second approach, I want to know what you think, that's where you're encouraging the audience to think for themselves. You're presenting them with the evidence and you're leaving it up to them. Even if you have your own perspective as the author on which side was right and which side was wrong, you're still not putting ideas in people's heads. Or if you are, you're doing it subtly. You're getting them to think about things, and maybe they're thinking about things differently than they would have. Like I said, that is very difficult to do, but if you can pull it off, I feel that's a really good way to get a message across. But what we're seeing more and more these days is that third one. This is what you should think. Like I said, that's propaganda, pure and simple. And it's not a good way to convey things. The only people who are definitely going to agree with you are the people who already agreed with you to begin with. People who are diametrically opposed to you from the get-go aren't going to listen. And people who didn't come to be preached to in the first place and just wanted some escapism? They're going to be irritated, and you'll drive them away too. Even if they want to think that you have some good points, they're probably still not going to like the delivery. But hey, don't take my word for it. Look at the declining sales of Marvel Comics recently, and see for yourself how well it works. That, I think, is the real issue. Somewhere along the line, the idea of letting people decide for themselves was discarded by the entertainment industry at large. And more and more these days, you have storytellers who just want to take their own opinions and shove them down your throat, whether you want it or not. And that's driving people away. That's what people are upset with. They're not necessarily upset with the idea that the fiction has suddenly become political. They're upset with how it's become political. They're upset with the delivery of those politics. Now, me personally, I'm fairly apolitical. I try not to get involved in politics if I can help it. If you put a gun to my head and forced me to pick a side, I might say that I'm slightly more conservative than liberal, but I don't think I'd go so far as to say that I am a Republican. I don't even know if I'm a Libertarian. I'm just not interested in politics. Now, a lot of the people whose work I enjoy tend to be politically left-leaning. And that perspective of them being politically left oftentimes gets into their work. And in older works, in older stories or movies or games or whatever, I can generally just recognize it and say, yeah, yeah, I see what you did there. I'm sure you think you're very clever, but I'm just going to ignore it and enjoy the other aspects of the story. And I was able to do that because those particular views were not presented as the point. 
These days, however, they are the point. It's much harder to ignore when it's everywhere. And that is the real problem. We need to get back to a point where the artists are allowed to express their views, but the audience is allowed to express their views as well, including the right to overlook the artist's views if they so choose. It's their prerogative. It's their choice. Just as it is the artist's choice to put those views in there in the first place. And that's just not something that's happening these days. It needs to happen again, though. Otherwise, we're going to see a collapse in the entertainment industry like we have never seen before. Then again, it might provide a chance for people like me on the up and up to come in and take their place, so now I have mixed feelings about that. Either way, though, that's my take on the whole thing. It's not necessarily politics that are the problem, it's the delivery of those politics. And whether or not you agree with me, well, that's up to you. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omniviewer signing off. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it, as well as subscribe to the channel for more content of a similar nature. Also, check the description for links to our Twitter, DeviantArt, and Patreon pages, as well as the Amazon link for the novel Operation Red Dragon The Daikaiju Wars Part 1, penned by yours truly. Thank you all, and we appreciate your support.